All right, welcome back. We are in Senior English B, and our objective today is to introduce you to one of the great poets of the 20th century, W.B. Yeats. Now, I'm starting on page 1168 in your hymnal. I want to help you here in regards to exam preparation. One of the ways I will do that is to, first of all, talk about Yeats and his biography. I'll give you a little bit of sense of who this cat is, and then we're going to look at his most famous poem, Sailing to Byzantium, and then as well, Second Coming. Let's begin, first of all, by saying what I think I have said before, especially when I hit T.S. Eliot. When you look at our time together, there are a handful of writers that we qualify as the most important writers. We began, for example, by pointing out that you really are working with major guns when you mention, for example, Wordsworth, or you mention Shelley and Keats, or Lord Byron. These are all really important writers. Moving into the 20th century, one of the most important and influential voices, as we already said, is T.S. Eliot, publishing Hollow Men in 1922. <coughs> Many, however, will argue that every bit as important as T.S. Eliot, and maybe more important, is the great poet Yeats. Now, the first thing I should point out about Yeats is he's Irish. He isn't English, he's Irish. He will live quite a bit of his life in England. He will travel in England and Britain, but he himself is Irish, okay? He is very much a patriot to the Irish cause. He's going to have an influence, for example, in creating and returning the Irish theater and drama and dramatic forms, and his poetry in large measure will play that game as well. The thing I like to say about Yeats, though, is he's the last of the great <coughs> romantic poets. By the time Yeats is writing, he's pretty much the back end of the romantic tradition that we started with, with Wordsworth, Byron Shelley, and Keats. But also, Yeats is very much a product of the 20th century. He very much is a understanding that there is this thing coming called the 20th century, and it's going to look totally different from anything in the past. Are you ready for this? I'm with you on 1171. Let's just do this one real quick. On 1171, second coming. Before the rise of Hitler, before the extermination of 8 million people by that lunatic, before that happens, Yeats will write a poem called Second Coming. Turning... And turning, I'm with you on 1171, so that's where you want to be now with me reading. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, and that's the way we say that word, by the way. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Now you can make an argument that no poet and no set of lines predicts the 20th century better than the lines we just read. Before Hitler does his craziness, Yeats will write, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Now are you familiar with this, this thing where they the falconer will have this bird who can fly away. Talk to us about this, Roth Ludner. They kind of train these birds, right? It's quite um, remarkable, right? Like some of them would be like messenger birds. Like yes. Some use them to hunt sometimes. They use, they call, right? The falconer, the person, uses a call that the falcon can hear and then will immediately turn and fly from sometimes miles away right back to the arm of the falconer. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's like magic. It's quite remarkable. Notice what Yeats says. This is where we've come to. Go ahead at 3A and make an observation. This will sound kind of like we are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas, our dry voices, when we whisper together, quiet and meaningless. This will sound similar to that. This is, for your notes, an assessment of what has gone wrong. What is screwed up and coming? What is, the bad, what is the bad future? Notice the first thing he says is the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Now I'll give you a hint at 3A what he means here. This is Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach 
And the sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its long withdrawing melancholy roar. Remember that? What is the point that he's making here about falcon and falconer, Mr. Nelson? What's his point here? Who would the falconer be? Uh, in religion, it would be God. There you go. And who, and, what would the, and who would the falcon then be? Yeah, that is to say, Yates will point out, there's some kind of loss. Arnold will call it the sea of faith. Here, notice, it's just the falcon. can't hear the falconer anymore. In other words, let's say it right out loud. Yates will draw a picture in Second Coming of a lost generation. Hemingway will make that a famous phrase, the lost generation. Things, there it is, a famous novel will be written by a very important African writer, Chibe. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. In other words, it's kind of like, and this word gyre in the first line is this, it's like uh, when you used to go to the park and somebody really big and strong when you were a kid could turn that circular thingy really fast and you were like holding on, but the faster it went, the more you started to be pulled away from the center, right? Okay, and you found yourself having to try to hold on and you couldn't hold on because that person could really whip that, that uh, thing around really fast. That's the word picture that's used here. The center can't hold. In other words, there was a time when we all kind of seemed together. Now, not so much anymore. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a word picture that then becomes darkly, darkly pessimistic. Look at the next one. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Write down in your notes the word anarchy and then give us a working definition. Mr. Durant, what does the word anarchy mean to you? Anarchy. No control. No of control law. of law. It's an outstanding definition. No control of law. All political order, gone. Everything that we understood as being kind of like har harmony and all of that, gone. Notice the next line. And everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. Ooh. What's that about? The ceremony of innocence is drowned. Well, note the irony. I told you this was a romantic poet. Our, in September, at the very beginning of our semester, remember, we worked with a romantic poet who, who did Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. Jot down his name. Oh, you bet. Uh, this evening, apparently, they've excused you from the front office. You'll be able to finish, however, uh, online, so no worries. Do you remember his name? Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. Who am I talking about? Who's the great poet here who talks about the loss of innocence? Starts with a B, doesn't it? Who was it? Not Byron. Blake, that's right. Good old Blake, remember? So Blake wow. writes songs of innocence, songs of experience, tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. He also wrote, a rem remember, little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Remember his comparison between the lamb and the tiger. Which one's innocent? The lamb is innocent. The tiger, of course, yeah, not so innocent. He's a killing machine, right? Notice what Yates just said. The ceremony of innocence drowned. Whoa. Blood tie blood dimmed tide is loosed. There's in other words, there's gonna be so much killing that innocence itself is drowned. To finish, reminding us that it was, you'll remember, um, um, uh, right at the beginning of the English part of the contest, right, that Chamberlain will come back from his conversation with a guy named Adolf Hitler and say, Don't worry, he's he's to be trusted. Take a look at what this line says. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Here immediately we think of T.S. Eliot's Hollow Men, don't we? Remember that Kurtz line right at the beginning, Master Kurtz, he dead? Remember, Kurtz is a violent, full of passionate intensity. What about the good people? Well, they lack what? What's the word? They lack what? What does that mean? They lack conviction. If you lack conviction, what does that mean? They have no will. You don't care. That's right. You have no will. So the good people no longer want to fight. The bad people want to run the show. Again, he writes this poem before the Second World War and the horrific uh, stuff of, of Adolf Hitler. It's quite remarkable.
Surely some revelation is at hand, he says. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming, hardly are those words out. When a vast image out of spiritus Monday troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and head of a man. A gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indigent desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed a nightmare by a rocking cradle, and what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Boy, does it tell you something, Mr. Brown, that in the second stanza, you have as much on the right-hand side in the form of notes as you have of the poet itself. Do you see that, Miss Keller? In other words, whoa, this is some confusing poetry, made easier if I tell you a bit of biography. Yeats was very interested in what happens after you die. That is to say, afterlife. Now, there's kind of two views of, well, I guess there's three views of what happens after you die. One view is that nothing happens. You're basically like the dog rover, you're dead all over. That's the end of it. Okay. But if you're talking about afterlife, what we sometimes call eschatology, the study of what happens after you die, Ostensibly, that argument breaks up into two parts. There's two, there's two answers to what happens after you die in the history of the world. One answer is what we call a linear view. That is to say, you are born, you live, you die, and that's it. And then after that experience, there's some kind of reward or punishment, heaven, hell, whatever, uh, that happens. That's a linear view. It's a one-ticket-to-ride idea. Okay. The second view is what we call a cyclical view. Cycles, circles. That is to say, you live, you die, but then you get to do it all over again. You reincarnate. That is to say, you come back and do it all over again. The soul doesn't die, but it comes back to re-inhabit another body or some kind of living or non-living object. That notion of reincarnation, right, is then often referred to as transmigration. In other words, your soul migrates. It goes into a body, then it goes out of a body, then it goes into a body, then it goes out of the body, okay? Now, let's point out that in the history of the world, there, the, the, these two answers, the transmigratory or the reincarnative view is a far more popular view. I mean, it's a much more ancient view, and it's been around for a really long time. The linear view, of course, is the monotheisms that we're familiar with, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and the like. Now, what happens is that Yeats is not really raised very religious, but he starts to become really interested in this question of what happens after I die, and he investigates both, and he kind of comes to his decision that he thinks that history is understood in 2,000-year cycles, and really important things happen every 2,000 years. And he begins to believe that there's this notion that everything is kind of cyclical, that civilization works for a while and then it kind of breaks down and then you got to have new civilizations that kind of take their place. And if you'll study that timeline we started with at the beginning of our year, right? Rome is now just a place where you go take pictures. At one point it ruled the world, right? See kind of how that works. So he kind of began to study history in this way. He believed that the reincarnated view for him was a more hopeful view. That is to say, even if you screw it up big time, you always get to come back and do it over and over and over so that you at least try and learn something each trip, that kind of thing. That's the reincarnated view, all right? Now, when you're looking at Second Coming, he's going to be playing the game of this 2,000-year cycle thing. His observation is that something is about to happen of course, if you'll think about it, see, you were already born when the century came to its close and the new century began with the 21st century, yes? Right? And you'll remember, if you were at all kind of conscious and around at the time, it became a big dog deal. Everybody talks about it, right? A new century is about to begin. The old century, it's not unlike this debate about what's going to happen here on the 21st of December in 2012 because somebody scratched on a rock down there in Central America. You see how that works. Uh, and, and all of a sudden now, you know, everyone gets all up in arms about what's happening next. Let's say that this is the prophetic voice of Yates talking about what's coming in the future. And let's just say it out loud. It's not a real hopeful view, is it? To that degree, at 3A, jot down on your annotations one or two other writers that immediately come to mind who are going to tell us that the future doesn't look real good. 
This is cactus land. This is dead land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Who wrote those words? Do you remember this whole thing of forming prayers to broken stone? There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars and this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. Who wrote that? Do you remember? who? What poem am I quoting? Here we go around the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Yeah, it's the hollow man, isn't it, right? So who, who wrote that? Who was the poet that wrote those lines? Those, those real upbeat, like, oh, that's right, that's, that's T.S. Eliot. Who else? Um, the sea of faith was once to at the full, and round earth's shore laid like the folds of a bright girdle furl. Who did we say was that poet? That's Matthew Arnold, and what was the name of that poem? Dover Beach, right? This, this is, uh, you have a number of poets like this. You can think of Darkling Thrush and the Thomas Hardy poem. Remember, he's at the very end of the, of the 19th century, about to begin the 20th century, and he hears that bird singing, and you know, it's, uh, he, his view of, the, of what's coming is not good. Let's now turn to Yeats's most famous poem, Sailing to Byzantium. I'm on page 1168. <clears throat> what I don't finish today, I will finish tomorrow. I want to begin... Uh, with the great American poet X.J. Kennedy. X.J. Kennedy. Kennedy was a great anthologizer of poetry. That is to say, he read millions of poems and then he built anthologies, okay? Uh, he, he would select what he considered to be the best poems. He was actually asked by a journalist once, um, you've read a few million poems, and he said, yeah, I have, because I had to select all these poems. For example, see, what you're looking at is an anthology. Um, let, me, let me say it this way. Um, you can have a number of poems written by Yeats. Notice your textbook only gives us two. I mean, he wrote over 500 poems. We have only two. Question, why do we have only two of these poems and not five of these poems? And of the two poems that we have, do you understand my question here, Mr. Keeley? Why this poem as opposed to another poem? Do you see? Now, the anthologizer is the one who gets to decide. X.J. Kennedy was one of the most famous guys who did that. In other words, he's read a bunch, and then he tries to pick what he considers to be the most important poems. A journalist asked S.J. Kennedy then, of all the poems you've ever read in the English language, what's the best poem ever written? Now, he thought he had stomped a guy like S.J. Kennedy. In other words, he thought he was going to hear something like, well, that all depends on what kind of poem, blah, blah, blah. Kennedy didn't even bat an eye. And he came back immediately and said, the greatest poem in the English language is W.B. Yeats' Sailing to Byzantium. Bam which sent a number of us who teach this stuff for a living to go back and look one more time at this poem. Because when Kennedy says this greatest poem written in the English language, uh, it, it, you, know, you know what I'm saying? He's, he's listened to a poem or two, I guess is what I'm saying. So the guy's got some right to be able to say, yeah, of all the poems I've ever read, that's probably the best one I've ever read. Well, let's take a look at it and see, okay? Uh, uh, for some of you now, you're going to say, well, I don't know. You know, we've done a few poems since September. Let's take a look now at this one and see what we think. Sailing to Byzantium. We'll read it, then we'll converse about it, all right? So that way we'll exegete, just like we've always done. I'm with you on 1168. Read it with me. Sailing to Byzantium. <clears throat> that is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms, the birds in the trees, those dying generations at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl, commend all summer long, whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect, monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered code upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school, but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O oh, sages standing in God's holy fire, as in the gold mosaic of a wall. Come from the holy fire, burn in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake, 
or set upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past or passing or to come. Now, one of the reasons why we read Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey is that we gain some confidence that if we can get through Ten Turn Abbey, we can get through a poem like this. One of the reasons why we read Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, Beauty is Truth, Truth, Beauty, that's all you know on earth and all you need to know. You'll maybe recall the lines. One of the reasons why we worked through such a difficult and esoteric poem is so we can read a poem like this. And I could go on, right? I could go on. In other words, we've been reading since September to get ready to read Sailing to Byzantium and to be able to have some sense of what it is that we're working with. Well, let's begin our exegesis process. Let's begin, first of all, though, and this may surprise one or two of you, we're going to begin at 2B, rhetoric. Not what the poet says, but how the poet says it. And we're going to talk about what kind of poem this is, and I'm, not, I'm going to see if you can write down, or if you've done your homework already, you already wrote it down, what kind of poem is this? Don't say it, write it. And I'll give you a couple of hints along the way. This is a poem where you have a person speaking with an imagined audience, not unlike the poem that begins at little prophets that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags matched with an aged wife. Or, not unlike, the wind set in early tonight. It tore this, the treetops down for spite. Not unlike, what's the one? This grew, I gave commands. Then all smiles stop together. There she stands as if alive. Remember? All three of those poems, I mentioned them in order as Tennyson's Ulysses, right? Of course, who are the other two written by? Do you remember? Robert Browning, Prophyrus Lover, and Last Duchess. All three of those poems, I could add one more in Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, Come to the Window, Sweet as the Night Air, where you have an individual speaking, and then there's some kind of imagined audience and some of us are saying, why can't I remember that word? It is a dramatic monologue. monologue. Very good. Let's write it down. The first thing we need to say about this poem is it's dramatic monologue. Dude, if you don't understand this, this poem is virtually inaccessible for you. Well, now wait a minute. About any dramatic monologue, we ask two questions. Who's the speaker and who's the speaker speaking to or what's the context, right? So, for example, in Last Duchess, you have a, a duke... A 700-year-old name, he said. He's a big shot. And he's talking about a picture of his last wife. He puts aside the curtain for only certain people. And we come to find out by the end of the poem, he's actually looking for his next wife. He's trying to impress the messenger who's been sent from the family of the girl he's about to marry, okay, or hopefully marry, all right? Of course, Prophyrus Lover is a little more disturbing. We have the killer speaking about what the evening went like and he actually is sitting there with Prophyra on his shoulder, right? By the end of the poem. Oh, don't worry. God hasn't said a word about what I've done. That is strangling my girlfriend to death. Now here, we have to ask a question. Who is the speaker of the poem? That is no country for old men, the young in one another's arms, the birds and the trees. And therefore, I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Who is the speaker of the poem? Well, let me give you an insight here that will help you. Two things. One, the speaker is old. An aged man is but a paltry thing. Lines we'll get to in a moment. He's old. Two, and this is really important. It doesn't make any sense. The poem makes no sense. The speaker of the poem is in a boat, a small boat. He's alone. He is sailing away from the land. He looks back over his shoulder, speaking to you, and he says about that land he's sailing away from, that is no country for old men. Well, if it's not a country for old men, who's it a country for? Look at the next line. Well, when is the last time you saw a beer commercial where you see these really old, flabby, fat people, old, disgusting people, drinking beer together? See, this is... No. What's a beer commercial? Fundamentally... Uh, it's not old people, it's what? The young. Look at it next. In one another's arms. The birds in the trees. Those dying generations at their song. So you have an old man in a boat 
sailing away. And as he's about to leave, the land is almost out of sight. He says something about where he once was. That is no country for old men. The title of the poem is Sailing to Byzantium. Which takes us to the next important observation. What is a Byzantium and why should I care? What is Byzantium, by the way? For those of us who did more than just fill out worksheets in our world history class, will maybe recall that Byzantium, uh, there are other names for this amazing city. What are the other names? Constantinople, right? The great city of Constantine. As well as today, Istanbul. Istanbul. Yes, the great city of shopping. One of the greatest shopping markets in the entire world is in Istanbul. Pretty much anything you want, you can find there. Some of it, of course, illegal. But nonetheless, it can be found in Istanbul. The great city of Byzantium. Byzantium at one point. Are you ready for this? Byzantium at one point was a city. All of the major buildings had gold on the roof, a layer of fine gold on the roof, so that in the morning when the sun came up out of the east and it hit the city, it would glow like it was on fire. It invited any number of marauders and conquerors. It wasn't real smart, was it? But it was a beautiful sight in its day. Byzantium, Istanbul, today still has some of the most amazing architectural site, um, centers in the world. Uh, some of the most amazing architectural buildings. Some of the cathedrals, the stained glass windows, and the mosaics that are there are mind-boggling. We could go there right now, and there are some of you who would walk into some of those structures and say, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. When they were constructed, originally, the city was the greatest city of art. So let's put that in our notes. Byzantium is going to be a symbol. A symbol of what? And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. Byzantium will serve as a symbol for what? Perfection. Perfection. We could call it heaven. Absolutely right. Well done, Mr. Chubis. So Byzantium, the goal, right? Perfection. That's where he's sailing towards. Uh oh, wait a minute. Now we're ready to write it in our notes. And then all of a sudden, this poem makes total sense. In this poem, we're not talking about an old fart in a boat actually sailing anywhere. We're talking about a man who is about to die. Absolutely. We're dealing with an old man who has lived his life on this earth and now is about to die. But right before he dies, he says something about the world that he's been living in. And about it he says, that is no country for old men. Well, who's it for then? The young in one another's arms. The birds in the trees. Those dying generations at their song. I remember years ago, I think I shared with you, coming to this community for the first time and making the observation of how ironic it was that in one building, the most ancient of our community are there waiting to die. Directly across the street, the most young, dynamic. Isn't that ironic? So that we can look out a window and see them in their building dying. That's what that structure is across the street. And they can look out their window at either the middle school or the high school and remember what it once was. The world is a place not for the old, he says, but for the young. Even though the young are dying, they just don't know it. Well, when we come back tomorrow, we will pick up with the text, Sailing to Byzantium. Hey, how about this? Do yourself a favor and actually try and do the annotation of sailing to Byzantium on your own. So that when you show up tomorrow to class, it's a crazy concept, I know, Mr. Uh, then I will be able to speak to you about a text that you actually have given some energy and time to. I'm, I'm not, you know, <coughs> demanding, I think, too great of an extreme position. Maybe I am. Thank you. <laughs>